When I decided I wanted to make a few YouTube videos looking back at some of my favourite Mega Drive games, and maybe a couple of my most hated games as well, I already knew which one I wanted to tackle first. It's not the Mega Drive game I spent the most hours on, or the one that I come back to most often now I'm a doddering old man too feeble of mind and body to do much else than look back on my misspent youth through a fog of nostalgia and regret, but it is the game that left the strongest impression on me when I first played it and the one I most wanted to revisit for a comprehensive retrospective. It is Echo the Dolphin 2. Well, I guess technically it's called Echo the Tides of Time, but that's never what I called it, so sorry. Why not the first Echo the Dolphin? Wouldn't it make more sense to start with the original? Perhaps, but while I did play the first game in the series back when it was new, and although I did like it a lot, I never finished it, and it just doesn't hold the same place in my cold, withered heart that the sequel does. There's also the fact that the original is infamous for being really rather frustrating, while the sequel supposedly streamlined the gameplay a little, and I doubt I could handle anything like a proper challenge these days, not with my decrepit arthritic fingers. So, Echo 2 it is. Now, I'm playing through the uh, Sega Mega Drive and Genesis Classics collection on Steam, which of all the ways to play Mega Drive games is definitely one of them. This fairly crude recreation of a gaming room doesn't look much like where I played games as a kid, but honestly I'd be a little freaked out if it turned out to be a perfect recreation of my childhood bedroom. The emulation is fine for my purposes, it's got issues, but uh, so long as it doesn't interfere too badly with the gameplay, I can live with it. Anyway, the game goes in and... Okay, the music. I'm just going to say it, in my opinion Echo 2 has the best soundtrack of any Mega Drive game. The only ones that come close are the Sonic series, the Streets of Rage series, and maybe the first Echo. And this first track, the one that starts playing the instant the power goes on, is amongst the best of the best. It's evocative, melancholy, and just perfectly suited to the overarching style of the game. I know musical taste is incredibly subjective, so I'll try not to gush too much about it going forward. I'll try, but I suspect I'll fail. Apologies in advance. You first gain control of Echo in this small cave, which is actually a cleverly designed difficulty select screen. Head diagonally up to the right, and you'll be playing on easy mode. Break the shells and head straight up for the hard mode. Just continue straight on to the right, and the game will dynamically change difficulty depending on how much you suck. And I suck a lot, being so old and doddery, so normally I might just go straight for easy mode, but here's the thing. If you play on hard mode, you get access to a few levels that aren't otherwise available. And I really do want to experience the game as I did when I played it 25 years ago, so I guess I'm in for some pain. Not in this first level though. Basically it's just an excuse to swim around, get used to the controls, and chat with your pod mates, which you do by singing at them. No challenge there. Except... <sighs> they move about quite quickly, and is this the same dolphin I already talked to? Okay, maybe I don't need to talk to all of them. Except for this one. This one really wants to do that old Groucho Marx mirror routine with you until you talk to him and he gives you a bit of exposition on what's coming up. And what's coming up is this. It doesn't look remarkable now, but back in its day this was an eye-catching bit of pseudo 3D. What you need to do here is swim through the rings that appear regularly, miss too many and you'll fail and be sent back to the start of the level. 
and it's pretty easy to miss quite a few, as some of them are above the surface and require a precisely timed jump to get to. Also, it's here that we see the first good example of what changes when you're playing on hard mode. Some of these rings are moving a lot faster and further than they do on normal or easy. Still, this first 3D level isn't too challenging, but it's only the first of many. Crystal Springs, and damn it, I'm already going to fail in my attempt to not gush too much about the music because I absolutely love this track too. It abandons the melancholy tone of the first track and picks up the energy a little, as if to say you're on your way now, time to get down to business. And it's just another nifty melody that builds into something really great. This level is pretty simple, all you have to do is find the four crystals, or glyphs, whatever, and nudge them into place. And this is another example of a difference that you only see on hard mode. On lower difficulty settings there are only three crystals to find. It's a fairly insignificant change, but I remember as a kid I found it really interesting and compelling to realise that there might be all manner of things just slightly altered to up the challenge. And I still think as far as difficulty settings go, it beats just increasing enemy health and the damage you take. Anyway, you need to sing to each of these crystals in a sort of rhythm to shake them loose, and it's not really difficult, but... Take Nabbit. I'm sure I'd never had trouble with this way back when. It's actually quite satisfying when you get it right and they break free, but... Oh, come on. When you finally get them all in place, you get the power to shatter stone and the path to the next level becomes accessible. This is another simple level, but it does introduce a gameplay element that becomes quite important. Some rocks can only be destroyed by other rocks, which uh, doesn't make that much sense if you actually think about it, and you have to use your dolphin -y skills to nudge the destroyer rocks over to their hapless victims. This is pretty easy in this first instance, but here we see yet another example of the hazards of playing on hard mode. These other rocks aren't present on lower difficulties, and getting rid of them requires a bit of finesse. And now, something vaguely related to the plot. In the first game, Echo gained the power to hold his breath indefinitely. Now, Metroid style, it's time for him to lose that power, which is somehow stripped away in this earthquake. Oh well, such is the way of the world, and of video games. Another Groucho Marx dolphin appears to explain what just happened, and it's on to the next level. This music, yep, for my money, it's another killer track. Tense, mysterious, foreboding. It's the perfect music to have playing now that you need to worry about running out of oxygen. And this is a worry that becomes a core part of the game. A lot of people remember how stressful it was in Sonic games where the poor little blue guy would start running out of breath and that brutal warning music would start playing. But for me, the real stress was here, in the Echo games, where you might be lost in a deep, dark cave far beneath the surface, Disoriented, desperate, and not sure where the nearest air source was. This level's a step up in terms of complexity, so it's a good chance to talk about the game's map system, which is something else I find really clever. You can send out a sonar wave, and if you hold down the button it comes back and shows you your immediate surrounds. This is pretty damn useful, and unless you have a great sense of direction and excellent memory, you're going to be using it a lot. I die at least a few times on this level, at least once from running out of oxygen, which is easily done if you're not careful. But it's not too tough, and before long I get to... Trellia, the mysterious time-travelling dolphin from the future. 
A bit more plot happens here. She explains that there are two possible futures, a good one and a bad one, and that an old friend wishes to sing to you. You don't really have much of a choice in the matter, so into the future you go. And here we are. This future is a pretty cool place, at least for dolphin kind. They can fly, they can carry you with their minds, according to them. And even primitive, non-flying dolphins like Echo are catered for with these tubes in the sky. This level isn't too tough either, although there's another new hindrance introduced in the form of a time segment where you need to get from here to here before the glyph closes. This time limit, at least, isn't too strict. The next level is basically more of the same, not super interesting, so I'm going to take this chance to talk about another unique dolphin-esque element of the game. Echo has a health bar, it's the one at the top in the upper right corner, and like many games you can get health back by eating, but Echo takes this trope and turns it into something that fits perfectly with the game world. Basically the schools of small fish scattered around the levels are your food source. You can charge into them to consume them and your health will be replenished. It's a small but rather nifty little touch. And it's actually made more interesting by the fact that some of the schools will turn into hazardous puffer fish if you hang around too long, and what you'd hoped would be a life-saving health can actually turn around and kill you. Okay, next level, and this one throws another dramatic gameplay shift at you. This one's an auto-scroller in the sky, and if you can't keep up, Echo is thrown back to Earth where his body will undoubtedly explode on impact with the rocks, and maybe even take up one or two of his flying descendants on the way. I should probably stop talking about what I'm not going to talk about, because I have to mention here one more hard mode change. This level moves a lot faster on hard mode, and honestly that makes it a lot more fun. I haven't talked about the actual controls of Echo too much, but this is a level where they really come to the fore, and you realise just how good they are. Echo moves smoothly and responsively, and switches directions with a slight sense of weight and momentum that feels just right. You can hammer the C button to speed up and press the B button for a charge that is your main offensive option, but which is also vital for making longer, higher jumps, and on this level at least, manoeuvring between the pathways. Honestly, it's fun just to swim and jump around in this game, and at no point do you feel hampered by the controls, even if they do take a little time to get used to. Anyway, this level is quite challenging, but it's also very short, and it's honestly enough fun that you're unlikely to feel too bad about plummeting to your presumably gory death. And it's followed by... Okay, I'm actually going to pause right here and talk a little about this next level before I show it, because, and this is going to sound like hyperbole, but I honestly mean it, this for me is the most memorable level of any Mega Drive game, and one of the most memorable moments in my gaming history. It's a short level, so I'll show it in its entirety without comment.
Right, first things first, the music. And this is going to be me gushing at my most gushingest, because holy crap do I love that track. Put simply, it rocks. By itself, it would rate as possibly the best piece of music to ever appear on the Mega Drive, but in the context of the level it accompanies, just... wow. If there's another example in the entire gaming universe of music so perfectly matching gameplay, I don't know what it would be. And the gameplay here is simple but incredibly compelling. All you have to do is get past the giant Medusa, but you have to use every tool at your disposal. Your dolphiny agility will be stretched to its limit. Again, this is a short but challenging level, and one that it's tough to get bored with. That said, there is a penalty for failure. I managed to do it first try on this playthrough, largely because on this one level I have had a fair bit of practice over the years, because every now and then I'll start up Echo 2, cheat straight to this level, and just wallow in the blood pumping music and gameplay. If you do fail though, and the Medusa manages to push you off the bottom edge, you end up back here. And although the glyph is open so you can immediately pass back through it, you still have to do the fast moving auto scroller. It's not a huge blow, that level is still fun, and honestly it's kind of hard to get pushed back in the first place. The Medusa won't pursue you all the way to the bottom, and unless you get unlucky, you can usually save yourself just by holding up on the d-pad when you start falling. Man, I love that level. On to the next. This is the first of the hard mode exclusive levels, and actually it's a little disappointing. It's another auto-scroller, but it's just not as fun as the first one. It's a little longer, and so a little more frustrating, and the twists and turns are a little more drastic. Essentially, it doesn't flow as well as the earlier example. But it's not bad, and just the fact that I managed to get to this exclusive level made me feel like a goddamn gaming superhero back in the day. Skylands. Here we have another level that takes something from an earlier level and makes it more frustrating without making it more fun. These bubbles, when you hit them with your sonar in just the right way, will propel you through the sky and into floating pools of water. Getting the right amount of momentum is kind of hit and miss, and you're never quite sure if you're supposed to be hitting the bubbles, or getting a lift with the future dolphins, or just leaping blindly from one pool to the next. The frustration really kicks in when you find yourself falling all the way back to the start, making you do all those iffy jumps again. It's not a terrible level by any means, and it can actually be satisfying when you get the jumps right, but it's not a highlight of the game. And this is a level that may actually be a low light. If nothing else, it demonstrates that in a game which focuses on the life aquatic, forcing you to leave that environment is a dubious move. This sphere turns you into a seagull, and, well, Echo's sprite is incredibly well animated for its time, it's relatively high in detail, and it just looks really good. This seagull does not. And it's not fun to play as a seagull. All you can do is flap your wings, giving you a speed boost. Eagles will attack you if you go too high and send you back to your dolphin form, and you have to fly into their attack range to get over this ridge. All you can do is hope they drop you down the other side. And once they do drop you where you need to go, that's basically it. You can swim straight to the second of the pseudo 3D levels. This one's a little trickier than the first. The seaweed moves in unpredictable ways, and so do the rings themselves, which can lead to some seemingly unfair situations. But it's not too tough, and before long you'll get to... Eagles Bay. Oh man, must we? My interactions with eagles in the previous level were more than enough. And if there are eagles, I'm guessing I'm going to be a seagull again. Well, yes, I am. But this level is just as simple and basically pointless as the last. You turn into a seagull, fly to the other end of the level avoiding falling rocks. I knew those floating rock pools were a bad idea. And you can actually avoid the eagles entirely if you don't go higher than you need to. Then you get the song from the glyph and fly back again. And that's it. I really do suspect these seagull levels were something that seemed like a good idea when the developers were working on this game, but they quickly realised they just weren't that fun, so they didn't bother putting much effort into them. Which is fair enough, I guess. They are something different in the most literal sense, and they don't take up enough of your time to be truly off-putting, 
but surely just cutting them out completely would have been the better option? Next level, Asteroids Cave. And hey, it's that music again. It's still awesome, but you know what? I kind of wish they'd reserved this track for that one boss level. That would have made it more meaningful. And it seems out of place on this level, which is fine, but nothing special, at least not until the end. You need to reunite the two halves of this crystal and this one, and there's this worm which you need to lure into the rocks to destroy them. With that done, you can at last meet up again with the asteroid. I say again because the asteroid was a key character in the first game. Basically it's a giant spinning double helix of globes, which may not seem like a particularly compelling character design, but there was something about it that I found really awe-inspiring as a kid. It seems so non-human and yet so enigmatic and powerful, I found it very appealing. Anyway, the asteroid does a bit of expositing, telling you how the events of the first game created two timelines, in one of which the Vortex Queen killed the asteroid, leading to the dark future. Oh yeah, the Vortex. I haven't actually mentioned them yet, have I? Basically, they're your standard evil alien race, heavily inspired by H.R. Giga, who came to Earth to devour all life, starting with Echo's podmates. The first game revolved around Echo's quest to get them back. As you might guess, based on the existence of this sequel and, you know, basic narrative conventions, he was successful. Well, I guess saving one timeline wasn't enough for Echo, so off he goes, back to the past, to set things right. Or at least he does if you can get past the asteroid. Hey, mate, you want me to save you in the past, right? Maybe you let me get by then? Cheers. And, oh god, this level. This level. It's actually a good level. I like it a lot, or at least I do when I'm not actually playing it. The concept is pretty simple. This orca is lost to children. Normally, I assume this would be a problem for the cetacean version of child protection services, but Echo's on hand to save the day, and this neglectful mother is spared her comeuppance. For now. So I have to scour this level, looking for the baby orcas, and bring them back to their mother. There are several factors that make this a significant challenge. Firstly, you can only have two of them with you at a time, so a fair bit of back and forth travel is necessary. Secondly, if you take too much damage while a baby orca is following you, they'll disappear and go back to their initial positions. Which is kind of irritating. I mean, come on baby orcas, if you can find your way back to the precise random spot I found you in, maybe you could at least try to find your mother by yourself. But they're babies and therefore idiots, so I guess I'll cut them some slack. Third, there's a lot of stuff in this level that wants you dead, including lack of oxygen, if lack of an element can be said to want anything. The baby orcas act as a sort of backup health bar in that if you reach zero health with one of them following you, you won't die, but the orca will reset. Or, or maybe Echo eats them to regenerate his health? That would make sense, that's what you do with the small fish after all. But then where do the replacement orcas come from? Are they some sort of demonic changelings? Alien clones? Am I overthinking this? Yes. Anyway, it's a challenge, but I do eventually manage to get all the babies back to their mother. And I certainly didn't have to use save states or anything, not that you'd know if I did, because it's not as if a giant icon comes up on the screen when you... Ah, oh, crap. Note to self, do a better job of editing that thing out. Once you've got them all back, one of the baby orcas signals you to follow, and honestly, this is the toughest part of the level. The little shit uh, rapscallion moves really fast, takes unnecessarily detours, and if you fall too far behind, he or she abandons you and you have to head back to the mother to start again. You know it would have saved us both a lot of time if you just waited another few seconds, right? Ultimately, it's a good level, too challenging for me these days, but just the right amount of challenging for back when my nervous system still worked and I had nothing better to do than butt my head against a difficult level for a day or two. Still, hoping for a bit of respite in the next level, Maze of Stone. 
Nope, it's a nightmare. It's another hard mode exclusive, and this time I can see why it was reserved for people actively seeking a challenge. It's probably the largest level so far, and it really lives up to its name, as it's basically a huge maze. So, navigating your way around is one of the biggest problems, but there are others. This thing, for instance, you need to use to destroy rocks. You can maneuver it by singing at it, but it's very easy to get it stuck in places where you can't actually get behind it to send it the way it needs to go. It's not too difficult if you're careful, but that's a luxury you don't have, because this bastard of a thing resets to its initial position after a set time. And when you finally manage to get it inches away from the rocks only to have it disappear, well, that's enough to induce rage in a stone sloth. And yet, I do think this is another good example of what this game does right. It's definitely a challenge to maneuver the ring of anemones, or whatever the hell they are, but the way Echo controls makes it a fun and satisfying one. This is true even though you can't move Echo with perfect precision. The fact he has momentum and can't quite turn on a dime means you actually have to apply considerable finesse, to a degree that was possible only in the very best games of the era. And the time limit is tight, but far from insurmountable. It's a good level, and the fact that it's a hard mode exclusive adds a sense of prestige, and means that completing it is a notable achievement in itself. Next level, Four Islands. The main feature here is another Follow the Leader style challenge, essentially identical to the one with the baby orca a couple of levels back, only this time you're following one of your own species. The margin for error also seems a little tighter here, as this impatient young whippersnapper will reset almost the instant you let him get off screen. Unless you've got finely honed reflexes, and as I think I've made clear, I do not, you're probably going to end up relying more on memorization than actual skill. Once you do have it memorized, which took my moldy old brain an eternity, but shouldn't be too onerous a chore for most people, this level isn't too much of a challenge. On to the next. Sea of Darkness. I found this level genuinely disturbing as a kid. The darkness, the ominous music, that dreadful feeling of being trapped in a deep, submerged place, cut off from air and light, it really stuck with me. Fortunately, it's not too long and not very difficult. You've got another rock-destroying thingamabob to maneuver and another baby orca to rescue, but neither of these tasks is anywhere near as tough as their earlier iterations, even taking into account the darkness of the environment. It helps that illumination is only a press of the A button away, it doesn't exactly make sense that Sonar is lighting up the world, but I guess it's just a metaphor for how a dolphin perceives the world, translated for our feeble human senses, or something. This level does introduce these not at all reminiscent of alien aliens, and they can be a pain. Letting one get too close is basically instant death, but they're slower than you and they're quite vulnerable to your charge sonar attack. I don't think I've mentioned this attack before, basically you just hit the charge button and then the sonar button almost immediately, and this lets your sonar wave do damage from a distance. This is something that gets more and more useful as the game goes on. At the end of the level, you run into the orca who was present when the Vortex Queen killed the asteroid. It shows you two of the asteroid's orbs being taken by alien scallywags, which turns out to be important information, as will be seen later. Anyway, I'm glad this is only a short level, even now I find it oddly oppressive. Vents of Medusa is next, and when I first saw that name as a kid, I eagerly anticipated another awesome duel with that giant jellyfish. I was disappointed. I didn't know it at the time, but Medusa is also a general term for what Wikipedia describes as the mobile, sexually reproducing life phase of some groups of jellyfish. So there is no giant sky jellyfish here, just a whole heap of its diminutive cousins or since we're actually back in the past here, or back in the present, which is the past relative to where the giant sky jellyfish was. I mean, when the giant sky jellyfish was. Anyway, I guess these boring things are the sky jellyfish's ancestors. They are indeed mobile, at least in a limited way, as Wikipedia suggested, but if they're sexually reproducing, I can't tell. 
Not that I really know what jellyfish sex looks like, and to be honest, I'm kind of reluctant to plug that phrase into Google. In any case, I really hope they're not sexually reproducing, because before long Echo is transformed into a jellyfish himself, and it's kind of an uncomfortable thought to wonder if the hero of the game is being sexually assaulted by tentacled blobs. I mean, what is this, a Japanese game? I kid, I kid. I love Japanese games, tentacles or no. In any case, this level is surprisingly boring, and another example of how the whole transformation mechanic is not utilised for good effect. It's kind of an interesting twist to now be attacked by your dolphin brethren, but gameplay-wise there's really nothing to it. You float up, turn back into a dolphin, swim along for a bit, go on to the next level. Not very exciting. Gateway. There's almost nothing in this level, apart from this weird thing with a giant tentacle. It's very easy to kill, but doing so doesn't seem to achieve anything as it respawns the instant you go out of range. Basically the only other thing in the level is the entrance to another pseudo 3D stage, which is essentially the same as all the others. Really not much to comment on here. The next level is called Sea of Green, and hmm, this actually looks kind of familiar. Oh great, I've messed up with naming my files, seems I've duplicated the gateway footage and deleted the Sea of Green footage. Yup, off I go to replay Sea of Green, I hope it wasn't a particularly long or tough level. Nope, it wasn't, thank god. The only thing of note in this level is another Groucho Marx dolphin, but this lazy bastard won't give way until you bring him a fish. There are fish all over the place, you can't swim 10 metres without coming across a large school, but this guy isn't going to move until you do what he wants. Maybe it's some sort of power trip, I don't know. Anyway, it's not too huge a hassle. There's one particular fish that can be manoeuvred like the rock destroying ring of thingamabobs, with the notable exceptions that it can't get stuck in the foreground and it doesn't disappear after a set time, which makes the whole level pretty easy. Next. And, ooh, it's another boss level. But not a particularly fun or interesting one, I'm afraid. All you do is follow this giant shell downwards, avoid the eels and getting crushed by the shell itself, then kill the shell's occupant. Doing this reveals two of the asteroid's orbs, and this is essentially where the next major section of the game begins. This cave is going to be your base of operations for a little while, as you set about retrieving all the other orbs that have been scattered around the place, plus the final two, which, well, you'll see. The next level is Sea of Birds. Oh dear, more seagull action? Fortunately, no. It's just a simple level which basically serves as an introduction to the orb collecting you'll be doing for the next little while. You can only have two with you at any one time, so you need to bring them back to the Asteroids Cave 2x2, two two, as if you were some sort of aquatic Noah's Ark. Actually, Noah's Ark was a boat, so I guess it was technically aquatic too, if it existed, which it didn't. The orbs tend to drift away if you go too fast, so mostly I try to take it slow but steady. They still sometimes disappear for reasons I can't fathom. Ha, huh, nautical pun, get it? But it doesn't take too long to get this simple level done. The next level, the eye, is a different story. The goal is the same, find the orbs and bring them back to the asteroid, but it's a much bigger environment and not exactly designed all that well. It basically consists of a central area with a number of passages radiating off it like uh, spokes on a bicycle wheel. The orbs are down these passages, naturally enough, but so are a number of glyphs which won't let you pass until you collect specific orbs. And which glyph opens up once you return a pair of orbs? There's no way of knowing other than trial and error, so every time you return from the Asteroids Cave, you end up going back down random passages, singing to glyphs until you find the right one. It's not a big deal, it doesn't exactly take much time, but it is time where you're just not having fun. And actually, this is probably a good example of how games and our expectations of games have changed in the last two and a half decades, because I specifically remember loving this level back when I first played the game, and I do still understand why. Back then, any instance of non-linearity in games was something to be cherished, even if that non-linearity meant trudging back and forth through samey corridors. Actually, can dolphins trudge? I imagine that's something that requires feet. Oh, whatever. 
You don't even have any choice in the order you traverse the level, which kind of makes the whole non-linear thing moot. However, even amongst the relatively open and varied levels of Echo 2, this one's stuck in my memory. It just hasn't stood the test of time. So now it's really just a chore, I'm kind of glad to get out of the way. Now we go from a level that was ostensibly non-linear to one that's about as linear as they come. And yet this one stuck in my memory just as much. Wales. And very evocative sound design. Actually, the music isn't really great in this level, but I love the intro at least, and it will forever be linked in my mind with the greatest of the denizens of the deep. And I do love the sound they make. There are only two orbs here and I managed to miss the one right at the start so I had to swim back for it, but I honestly didn't mind. I know they're just relatively simple 2D images, but I still find something awe-inspiring and joyful about the whales here. Deep Ridge is another level that uh, revolves around tracking down pairs of orbs, and it's both more interesting and more challenging than the last. There's nothing particularly remarkable about it, it's just quite complex, and there are a few places where you're going to have to move quickly or risk running out of oxygen. This level was also made a bit more pleasant by a discovery I made. Remember when I said I was moving slowly to stop the orbs drifting away? Turns out that was a mistake. As long as you keep moving at a decent velocity, they stick with you no matter what, even if you're leaping through the air. Which is good to know, because in this level, if you're not going quickly, you're probably going to drown. Anyway, once you've got all the orbs in this level, there are only two more to be found. But the asteroid tells you that these last two, the ones that were stolen by the aliens that look like the aliens from aliens, but definitely aren't the aliens from aliens, have been taken into the dark future, so you've got to find a way to go there and probably the local bus service isn't going to cut it. The next level is another wacky transformation level, and it's probably the best of them, which honestly is kind of a low bar. This time you get to be a shark, and actually it's kind of fun, partially because the shark can travel at speed significantly higher than you can as a dolphin, but mostly because you get to attack all these other snooty dolphins. At least, that's what I find most enjoyable. Possibly that says bad things about my psychology. Try as you might though, you can't kill them. Dagnabbit. Up next is another level with one of those weird long tentacle things. In fact, it seems to be identical to the last level that had one of these. This time though, I actually bothered to talk to the nearby glyph after killing the arm thing, and it tells me I now have the hunter song, which I can use in the open ocean. Turns out that now, when I go through the ring to the next pseudo 3D stage, I have a special attack. It also turns out that this attack is kind of useless. It's essentially a smart bomb that targets every shark on screen, which is okay, but it seems to have limited uses and I run out very quickly. That leaves me trying to get through this stage the old fashioned way with wit and reflexes. So basically I'm doomed to die a lot. Perseverance pays off though. And the save states might help too, if I ever use them. Ahem. Luna Bay. Actually a pretty simple level, but one that's filled with enemies that can cause you serious issues. The non-aliens aliens are out in force and will still kill you before you can blink. There's also a bunch of these, I don't know, lobster-like aliens that move a lot faster, but don't pose so much of a threat. This is actually a good opportunity to mention one more thing I've neglected until now. In some levels you can find this power-up. Once you have it, for the rest of the level you can double tap the A button to shoot out four damaging sonar blasts. It's handy, but not game-changing in most levels where it's found. But in this one it can be a real lifesaver, as the lobster aliens can come from multiple directions at once, 
and it can safely take out the non-aliens aliens before they can get close. Alas, it will not save you from being grabbed and taken into the dark future by these two scoundrels. I mean, I say alas, but the whole idea was to somehow find a way to the dark future, so really it was kind of a bad move for the bad guys to abduct you. Why is it bad guys never just outright kill the heroes, even when said hero was a dolphin? Oh well, I guess some narrative conventions transcend species. So here we are in the dark future, and this is where the game throws at you its biggest gameplay curveball yet. Because what we've got now is a bunch of levels where you spend more time out of the water than you do in it. You'd think for a game where you play as a dolphin this would be a bad move, but somehow it works. At least I think it does. I can imagine that opinion might be split on some of these levels, but I quite like them. Basically the game now involves flopping around through a metallic alien environment, sliding down slopes, taking out amorphous blobs, and occasionally being dicked around by gravity, as indicated by the little radar dish type thing at the top of the screen. And quite often, falling off the bottom of the level to your ultimate demise. There are also chrome spheres that you can pull towards you with your sonar, and which more often than not will crush you to death. At least that's my experience. They're necessary, however, for clearing out the metal blocks that bar your path. And joy of joys, there are actually checkpoints in this level. Sing to crystals like this, and when you die you'll be given the option to start back at their location. Just remember to sing to them again once you respawn, or they won't reactivate, and the next time you die you'll be back at the start of the level. I'm sure if you were relying on save states these crystals wouldn't be all that significant, but since I, of course, would never do such a thing, they're a godsend. The next level is essentially more of the same, but there are a couple of occasions here where if you miss a jump, you have to slowly, agonizingly try to leap back up a slope, and apparently this is something dolphins are not very good at. Probably you're just supposed to concede defeat, slide down to the bottom and go around for another try, but I'm the sort of person who will butt my head against any wall in an attempt to save time, even when doing so demonstrably takes twice as long. Gravitor Box is the last of these levels, and well I have to admit I got kinda lucky here. It seems to be a relatively complex level with disorienting gravity shifts and branching paths, but I just flopped around randomly for a while and found myself at the exit. Hooray for blind luck. Next up is what I would consider the second most memorable moment from the game, after the giant sky jellyfish. It's another boss fight, but I use the word fight in the loosest possible sense. Your opponent is this giant immobile alien globe. Behold! And yet, this level is really rather fun. You sing and charge at the globe, and it wobbles back and forth on the tethers that hold it in place. Wobble it enough, and it'll break free, allowing you to send it crashing into the walls, doing damage. It can easily reattach itself though, and when it does, it will start healing itself, so you really need to keep it moving. Of course, the more it moves, the more of a threat it becomes. This is a relatively large globe in a relatively small room, and it's very, very easy to get squished. Things get worse when you do enough damage to destroy the tethers. Now at least the globe can't heal itself, but it also stops being a passive entity. It starts charging at you, which can be helpful as it will damage itself if it misses, but all it takes is one mistimed movement and you'll be crushed. It's honestly more fun than it might appear. Particularly at the start, when it's still tethered, it's quite enjoyable to wobble it around trying to break it loose. I don't think it exactly counts as a physics simulation, but it's about as close as you could get on the Mega Drive, and certainly the feeling of weight and momentum is convincing. It does get a tad frustrating when you get squished for the hundredth time, but that's mainly down to my arthritic slow moving fingers, so I can't hold the game responsible for that. Once you collect the last of the Asteroids Orbs, you go back to the past, and... Ah, crap. Well, this ain't good. Okay, here's the thing. 
I've been using a level select cheat to make it a bit easier to record footage of specific levels. It's quicker than entering passwords. And so far that's been fine, but it turns out if you do it here, you restart this level without the orbs. Which means you're totally screwed really. There's nothing for it, I'm gonna have to do that last boss level again. Honestly, I don't even mind. It's fun. Up to a point. Okay, that's better. Now it's just a quick trip to return the final orbs, and apparently the asteroid gives you the power to defeat the Vortex Queen. It's not exactly clear what that power is, but one does not question giant double helices. Going back through the portal, you find yourself in a battlefield. The uh, battle water, battle sea, whatever. Make your way through the carnage and you get to some sort of alien construction. Wait, are we still in the dark future? I thought we were back in the present. I guess this is like some sort of newly built alien fortification. Honestly, it's all getting a little too convoluted for my tiny brain to process. In any case, once you're there, you have to face another auto-scrolling section. This is quite different to the waterways in the sky though, the danger here is not falling but being crushed. Also in my opinion this just isn't as fun, it's more about memorization than it is about skill. Pick the wrong path and you're totally screwed no matter how skillful you are. The next level is more of the same, another auto-scroller. It's fine as far as it goes, but it's a bit of a damp squib, as not only is this the third and final hard mode exclusive level, it's also the last level before the final boss. And honestly, the final boss itself is also a bit of a disappointment. There's not much to it, and what there is isn't that much fun. You've got to shoot the alien head with your sonar while avoiding getting sucked into its gaping maw. This is made harder by the red tentacle that tries to grasp you, and the beam that slows you down temporarily when you touch it. If you slow down when the alien starts sucking, you're going to be swallowed. Which is not a sentence I ever thought I'd have to say. Being swallowed isn't the end of the world though. You find yourself in another alien environment where you are instantly transformed into one of the lobster aliens. From there you can make your way back and escape from what is, I guess, the alien's digestive system. As far as I can tell though, it regenerates full health when you get swallowed, so actually this all ends up just being a longer, more tedious way to reset the level. It's kind of irritating. Anyway, the slowing beam is in just the right place to be maximally annoying. It's tough to manoeuvre yourself to be facing the alien in the right way to actually do any damage. Once it retreats a little, it's tough to even get close enough to see it without also being in striking range. It's not super difficult, but it's not really all that fun either. It's not the best way to end the game. And as it turns out, it's not the way the game ends at all. Well, here we are, back home, that awesome music is playing, everyone's come to congratulate Echo, the dolphins are showing off their synchronised swimming skills. The credits roll. Or, more accurately, they're sung to you by another dolphin in what might count as a truly catastrophic demolition of the fourth wall. And then, seems like we have control of Echo again. Hmm, time to do a little exploring. And what's this? Another gateway? Yep, one last pseudo 3D stage. And it's the most painful one yet. Turns out you can actually destroy a ring by hitting it with your sonar. Well, that's just dandy. It 
seems the asteroid has a final mission for you. Destroy the time machine that started all this parallel timeline nonsense. It also allowed you to stop the alien invasion in the first game, but hey, what are the odds of that happening again? So off you go to Atlantis, where you are greeted by a block matching puzzle, another somewhat random gameplay divergence, but not a particularly taxing one. There's another lazy dolphin who demands a fish, and this one is floating right in front of a school of large juicy specimens. Is he some kind of food snob? Are these things right here not sophisticated enough for his refined palate? Sigh. And here we go for one final transformation level. And okay, I actually have to give this one some credit. This is a pretty amusing idea. You are now a school of fish. Yep, those things that you have been mercilessly, thoughtlessly consuming throughout the game, you are now them. And apparently there are a lot of hungry dolphins around. The gameplay in this level is basically non-existent. You can't do much other than swim as fast as you can through the linear level. But I still think it's pretty cool. It's a nifty inversion, and I love the way the number of fish in your school is functionally a health bar. If the dolphins eat them all, you're dead. Fortunately, the other schools are still a source of health, as if you get close to them, they'll join your school to reinforce your numbers. There's nothing else to it, but yeah, I think it's a good and creative idea. And here we have it, the final level. Even more final than the final boss. The City of Forever. And even now the game is throwing new gameplay elements at you, which is kind of impressive really. Most of this level involves following these alien spawn wings around without getting too close to them. There are a lot of doors that will open for them but not for you, and if you're not tailing them at just the right distance you either get locked out or squished. As far as actual gameplay goes, it's not the most compelling way to round out the game, but it's not terrible either. Go through this final portal and that's it. Echo arrives at the time machine from the first game, possibly the only sonar activated time machine in the multiverse, and uh, hey Echo, you were supposed to destroy this thing? Oh well, game's got a sequel bait I guess. And then, oh come on, I mean, yeah, ideally I would have done this without cheating, but I'm a doddering old man now. Should that be held against me? I tell you what, when I get 100,000 YouTube subscribers, I'll do a full playthrough of this game on hard mode, live, on stream. Right now I have... let me just check... yep, I have zero subscribers, so I'm well on my way. The final epilogue text scrolls by, and yes, this truly is it. I have completed Echo 2 again. Maybe not in the way God or Seeger intended, but I have done it and that's enough for me. The main point of this whole process was to look back at a game I loved more than just about anything 25 years ago, and judge how well it had stood the test of time, and how much my own perceptions had changed. What conclusions can I draw? Well, it's still a damn fine game. Would I still call it the best Mega Drive game of all time? No, but I understand why I considered it to be so, and I still think it's one of the best. The gameplay certainly still holds up. Echo controls perfectly, and with a lot more nuance than the vast majority of 16-bit games. The graphics and sound also still hold up. Actually, I barely even talked about the graphics. I guess that's the element that tends to become dated the fastest. But it was an incredibly good-looking game for its time, and I still think it looks great. The environments, the colours, the sprites, well, most of the sprites, all of them were top class. 
and there was a realism to it that was very unusual for the time. Echo was no cartoony mascot, he was a real live dolphin. Well, not live obviously, but you know what I mean. It's only some of the design choices that haven't held up, and there's definitely a few levels that seem more like filler than grade A material. But on the whole, when I started replaying it, Echo 2 was one of my all-time favourite games, and it still is. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, this is my first foray into the world of YouTube, so please let me know what you thought in the comments. Uh, but maybe try to do so in a way that won't break this doddering old man's heart. You wouldn't want to be responsible for the death of some old codger, would you? I've already got the next game I want to take a look at lined up, but you can probably figure out what it is if you watch closely enough. Until then, get off my lawn.